We've been looking at the uh, nature of radical Christianity over uh, a few weeks by examining six words that were uh, written at three points in the life of a, a young man uh, whose story is not widely known uh, by the name of William Borden. And uh, they were found in his Bible at the time of his death. And um, what uh, we've been considering is uh, when we compare his life, uh, certainly to mine, maybe to yours, maybe to the average UK uh, church attender, um, there really is no other description for him other than radical. But the question that comes to the forefront as we begin to line up William Borden's life with the uh, New Testament, uh, with the uh, claims of Christ, with the, the lifestyles of the disciples that are described in the Acts of the Apostle, uh, the question is then, was William Borden radical or was he a normal Christian? I understand that uh, not all of us are called to leave our roots uh, to leave our business jobs, uh, homes and families, set sail to China or elsewhere. But in terms of the, the cause and the call of Christ being at the very forefront of our, our lives, our decisions, our motivations, I think that there is a challenge here um, to, to seek to rise above mediocrity, uh, to see average as the enemy of the fulfillment of our destiny in Christ and to, to try and embrace something of the implications for us as, as churches as, and as individuals uh, to live with these, these words, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. The first phrase was written uh, when as a young millionaire, William Borden uh, decided to give away his personal fortune. Then the second phrase, no retreat, he, uh, he wrote when his father, in the light of that decision, decided to, to cut him off from the family business. And then the third phrase that we'll, we'll look at today was written just before his death. But at the age of 25, he set sail for China, and his plan was to, to pioneer outreach to a particular Muslim group. So in order to prepare, he stopped off on his way through in Cairo uh, to undertake uh, Islamic studies and to learn Arabic. And within four months of his arrival, uh, he contracted meningitis and died. When the news of his death reached America, nearly every newspaper carried the story. And it was said, a wave of sorrow went round the world it seemed that Borden not only gave away his wealth, but himself. In a way, here's this word, Matt. Uh, where, where did Matt go? Oh, yeah, there he is. In a way so joyous and natural that it seemed a privilege rather than a sacrifice. Even the fact that he set sail on December 17th seems extraordinary to me. How many missionaries leave just before Christmas? Well, I don't know, but William Borden did, and he did it willingly. And as his life passed so prematurely from this world's perspective, he was able to say that he had no regrets. And so that kind of poses for me a, a second question. How can we live a regret-free life? I think the natural response to this is to think about the incredible sacrifice that uh, Borden made and perhaps my response in the light of that. And, and to think about uh, perhaps standing before Christ one day, the Bible teaches that every believer will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be, uh, we're told that our lives will be judged by him. And my tendency when presented with that kind of image is to think along the lines of the old hymn that says, by and by when I look on his face and the refrain goes, I wish I'd given him more. But the danger of that kind of image is to think that it's all about sacrifice. The Christian life is a life of sacrifice. The call is to take up our cross daily and follow. That is sacrifice. 
to deny ourselves, that is a sacrifice. That is something we need to respond to. The call is in, uh, in light of what Christ has done for us in sacrifice to, to live in response to that life of sacrifice, sacrificial living in a decadent, self-indulgent, uh, self-centered world. And it is an area where perhaps we need to hear the call of Christ afresh. But it might come as a surprise to you that there are two major instances in the Old Testament where God has regrets. Where God deeply regrets doing something. And the first one is that in the instances that surrounded the story of Noah... Uh, we can gain a clue into perhaps how we can live a regret-free life. God, in his interactions with Noah, grows, uh, deals with Noah, and it grows out of his regret at creating mankind. Wickedness in the earth has reached such a scale that God regrets making mankind. Uh, some of the versions have the word grieved. God was grieved. And it's the same Hebrew word as to regret. And God's response is that he's going to sweep away mankind in judgment. Except for the fact that he finds or notices one righteous man, Noah. And we're told that Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. Now hold this thought, it was Noah's righteousness that got him noticed. We're told that he did all that the Lord had commanded him. He is the one redeeming feature in the whole mess of humanity that God regrets ever making. So hold that thought. Then the second major regret that God has uh, that's recorded for us is in the reading that Jane brought to us and uh, it surrounds the life of King Saul. Saul was the the first king of Israel and uh, he wasn't God's choice, he was uh, the choice of the people in a, a popularity vote and God kind of went along with things until they steadily went downhill. And then we get to uh, 1 Samuel 15 and verse 11 and we're told that the the Lord told Samuel, who was the godly prophet at the time, I regret, same word there, and this was in Genesis 6, that I made Saul king. Because he has turned away from me and no, not kept my instructions. So he's not been righteous. He's not done all that the Lord commanded him like Noah. Now we, we heard that in the reading that Saul even claimed to keep some of God's instructions when he hadn't. And it was this refusal to obey right down to the last detail that caused Samuel to come out with this epic statement. Saul is kind of saying, well, I've, I've done most of what God asked me. Uh, look at the great worship service we've been having. And Samuel says, in effect, you can have great worship service services. You can perform religious acts. But to obey is better than sacrifice. And the conclusion you kind of can get drawn towards here is that nothing delights the heart of God like obedience. We've lived through several decades of being told that nothing delights the heart of God like worship. But actually, in these instances, we're pointed in a different direction. That actually the reality is we can't worship unless we're obedient. And if we're going to live regret free, if God is going to look at our lives and have no regrets about us, it is obedience that he's looking for. And I want to just share briefly, as briefly as I can, three keys to an obedient lifestyle for you to chew over perhaps in the coming days and see if they help you in your Christian discipleship. And I believe that these are keys that will help us to unlock regret-free living. 
to live with no regrets. The first one is a lifestyle with continual repentance. All of us will say and do things that we regret. Uh, we listened to the music uh, of a chap from Canada called Corb Lund, and he has a wonderful song called Tattoo Blues. Basically, the moral of the story as it unfolds in the song is that uh, if you're going to get a tattoo, don't do it on a big night out because you might well end up living with no regrets uh, tattooed across your shoulder blades. If you've got Amazon music, give it a go. I'm sure it'll put a, far, a smile on your face if, even if you don't like country music. For all of us, there will be regrets in life. Actions, moments of rashness, possibly seasons of all-out rebellion. But I find it amazing that God has built into this life that he's called us to live a, a, a means to deal with those regrets. And it's simply called repentance. In 2 Corinthians, the, the, the reading that uh, uh, Brian brought for us, Paul rejoices in the benefits of this. And uh, he tells us that there are two kinds of sorry. You'll know this if you ever deal with, with children. If you have to say to a child, say you're sorry, and you get a kind of like, sorry. That is what Paul would call uh, worldly sorry. It's, uh, a, a grudging sorry that's got no, no heart in it. And that's the kind of sorry that brings death, Paul says. But Paul says there's another kind of sorry, a godly sorry, sorry with a change of heart, sorry with a change of direction, sorry that, that really expresses, I've learned my lesson, I'm not going to do that again, I'm not going to live that way again. Godly sorrow, Paul says, that brings repentance and leads to salvation, and leaves no regrets. I don't know if you knew, it is possible to live a regret-free life. Is that something that appeals to you? Do you believe it's possible to look back on your blunders, your mistakes, your, your seasons of rebellion, and feel no regret for anything? That is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of a lifestyle with continual repentance built in. It establishes us in a place where we live regret-free. And Paul says it enables us to forget about those things that are behind and press on. Don't you think that's a, a wonderful gift? I said a, a few weeks ago that, uh, in a kind of different way, that, that we are products of our past, but we are not prisoners of it. And that's a wonderful thing when we look back upon our lives. The second key to uh, regret-free living is a lifestyle with purposeful contentment. There's a story told, I'm not sure if it's true, uh, but it kind of illustrates the point for us of a, a king called Henry III of Bavaria. And he grew tired of court life and the pressures of being a monarch. And he applied to enter a local monastery. And the prior of the, the monastery was concerned that as a king, he would find it difficult to uh, live that lifestyle. And so he said to him, do you realize that the pledge here is one of obedience? And that's going to be hard for you as a king. And King Henry replied, I understand. The rest of my life, I will be obedient to you as Christ leads you. And the prior then said to him, then this is what you will do. Go back to your throne and serve faithfully in the place where God has put you. If we're going to live regret-free, if we're going to live a life where we can write in our Bibles at some point, no regrets, we need to become content with the purpose that God has given us. To obey is better than to sacrifice. 
The problem with these kind of uh, messages that I've been preaching over the last few weeks is that it can leave us with the idea that we should all be rushing off to the mission field, that we should all be uprooting our lives and going off to do some great thing for God. And we don't feel affirmed that if we are doing what God has called us to do right where we are, then we are doing a great thing. And we need to cultivate a lifestyle of purposeful contentment to see the roles and the responsibilities that God has given to us as essential to his purposes. If we're a, a mother or a teacher or a, a nurse or a scientist and we've been planted where we are by God, then we need to be the best in that role that we can be right where we are. It doesn't mean that we will always be there. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be open to his voice and his leading. And that, but we need to embrace the idea that there's a job for Jesus only you can do. And it's where he's placed you with the task that is in front of you. When William Borden lay sick and unable to study and witness, he might well have been full of regrets. His healing or not was in God's hand. Certainly not lack of faith. But he got caught up in the divine will of God for him, whether he was sick or well. And if you're going through ill health or perhaps joblessness at the moment, we can take a great encouragement from this embracing of purposeful contentment. And to perhaps ask the question, what is it I can do for God in this season of life that I wouldn't be able to do when I'm busier with other things? And if we can adopt that kind of outlook on our lives as the different seasons unfold, then I guarantee it will put you on the road to regret-free living. Then the third key to living with no regrets is a lifestyle with eternal perspective. I mentioned at the beginning of my message the judgment seat of Christ, a, a future day, a place where we will all stand. And I guess in that moment, we will truly know if we have lived with no regrets. And I mentioned the, the uh, tendency that that image has to bring about thoughts of sacrifice and devotion. Have I given everything for and to Jesus? But it's interesting to me that in the passages that, that focus on that kind of future judgment of the believer, it tends to focus on our works, what we will receive from Christ in light of our works, the things that are due to us for our actions, the things that we have done. And really the emphasis is on obedience rather than sacrifice. For William Borden, it's easy to be impressed by the scale of his sacrifice. He had a lot to give up, and he did so willingly. And that's impressive. But in those final days of his life, I'm not sure that it was his great sacrifice that he would have been thinking about as he lay dying. As he wrote those words, no regrets. I don't think he would have been thinking, I'm really glad that I sacrificed so much for Jesus. I'm going to meet him shortly, and at least I'm going to be able to say I gave everything. I think his thoughts would have been much more upon the fact that he had been obedient to the call of Christ. And if that life was short or long, productive or laid aside, he was obediently where God had asked him to be. I think that is why he was able to write no regrets. I mentioned in my, my first message that William Borden only left us 850 words. Let me read to you about 10% of them. 
He said, in the New Testament, we find that Christ was not looked on as Savior alone, but also as Lord. It was the Lord Jesus Christ whose name they bore, and that then meant that he had absolute jurisdiction over them. What does it mean to be a Christian? A Christian is one who believes in Christ as his personal saviour, who strives to please him as his Lord, and who worships and adores him together with the Father and the Holy Spirit as very God of very God. And unless we develop a lifestyle with an eternal perspective, unless we discipline ourselves to, to think and to contemplate and to be aware that one day we will stand before the one we claim as our Lord. We may live regret-free, but we will never die regret-free. We'll never stand before him with no regrets. We might, like King Saul, engage in all manner of religious activity. We might, like King Saul, engage in so-called worship but not have done what he asked us to do. Not have simply obeyed him. And in the passages that surround what will happen when we leave this world for the next, that seems to be all that matters. If your faith hasn't made you love others, if your faith hasn't made you obedient to Christ, and to use Paul's phrase, we shall escape, but only through the flames. Paul says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may rec receive what is due to him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built, has, what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He will be saved, but only as one, escaping through the flames. Amen. Well, the Lord bless you. Thank you for coming. Uh, and listening to these three messages, it's been a real, real pleasure to, to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.